Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Yaqeen Institute. This is our weekly program. I'm your host, Imam Tom Fakini. And boy, what a week it has been. Of course, topping the news for this past week was uh, Yahya Sinwar um, was killed in live action. It's very, very dramatic videos being released online about his final moments. Now, one of the more interesting things in the wake of the killing of Sinwar is the question for the motive and the reason why the attacks and why the um, aggression from Israel is still continuing. If you recall, Israel was saying for the longest time that this is all because of what happened on October 7th, 2023. Everything that they've done is because of that. And that basically once they avenge that sort of action, then there's no reason to continue the, the fight. Of course, now that Gaza is completely decimated and the, the mastermind behind the October 7th attack is has been killed. One would think that the reason for war has been uh, satisfied and that there would be no justification to continue. Of course, we know better than that. That's not what they're saying now in the media. Israel is saying that they will continue no matter what. Even U.S. officials who have been extremely lenient in allowing Israel to continue its bloodshed have started to publicly say that, okay, guys, it's time to, to cut it out. But there's no signs of Israel stopping any time soon. One of the unfortunate um, consequences, but fortunate because it allowed us to sort of reflect and benefit from this, was some of the sectarianism that was on display within the Muslim online sphere after the killing of Sinwar. Uh, there was one particular video that went viral from, I believe, uh, a Yemeni scholar or personality, I've never heard of him before, that was basically expressing joy uh, at seeing um, uh, Sinwar killed. <laughs> يفرحون بموت أهل البدع يفرحون بهلاك أهل البدع ونحن نسجد شكرا لله عند أن نعلم أن أحد من أهل البدع من الأخوانجية أو السرورية أو جماعة التبليغ أو غيرهم من الفرق الضالة والمنحرفة بالذات من الرؤوس لما نعلم بهلاكه نسجد شكرا لله هؤلاء يا أخوان والله يستريح منهم العباد والبلاد والشجر والدواب Many people took to social media to express their outrage with this particular take. And certainly uh, we have a video that we'd like to show from Sheikh Uthman Khamis, um, who's an authority and even within Salafi circles when it comes to especially Aqidah and knowledge of, of intersectarian strife. <laughs> أن يعاون المشركين على المسلمين وأن يفرح بانتصار المشركين على المسلمين هذا يخالف الولاء والبراء لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حد الله ورسوله فالذي يتولى المشركين ضد المسلمين يكون منهم كما قال الله تبارك وتعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعضهم أولياء بعض ومن يتولهم منكم فإنه منهم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين فالقصد أن معاونة المشركين على المسلمين والفرح بذلك فهذا أيضا من أعمال الكفر نعم so you see that Sheikh Uthman Khamis has very, very strong words for anybody that would take joy in such a thing that he equates it to an act of kufr, of, of disbelief or denial or rejection, and that it might be something that could take somebody out of the fold of the faith. And it certainly historically, if you see the times when Muslims were the weakest, that was when they allowed their sectarianism to get to the point where they would basically attempt to court the assistance of others against each other. So if you go to uh, Palestine and the Crusaders, um, there were different groups that were attempting to court the assistance of the Crusaders against their fellow Muslims. If you go to Muslim Spain, there were Muslim groups and political organizations that were attempting to court the assistance of the different Spanish kings against their Muslim rivals. That whenever this has happened, uh, it has led to horrible bloodshed, chaos, uh, and terrible division within the community. So it's very, very important to realize that you know, there's levels to it, that you can have an adversary and you can disagree with somebody when it comes to uh, either, you know, some sort of sectarian difference or some sort of aqidah difference, but it is a level that is beyond the pale uh, to attempt to say that you are rooting for somebody else against them. You're rooting for somebody who is a genocider, who is a horrible oppressor in order to take out your opponent. 
uh, that is that is beyond the pale, and that is something that is should make people question their faith or the the soundness of their faith. So speaking of Islamic scholarship, there was a very interesting post by uh, Brother Enwar on Twitter who brings attention to something that many people have been speaking about in the last year, the world after October 7th, 2023, one of the many, many things that has come under reconsideration are the types of peace forums that many Islamic scholars are invent invited to speak at. Now, in a post 9-11 world, these became very, very popular, that trying to clarify doubts about Islam when people in the media were trying to peddle the line that Islam was sort of uniquely violent or inherently barbaric or that it was some sort of retrograde religion or ideology, many of these peace forums sought to combat such narratives. However, we've seen, uh, especially in the last year and change, that many of these forums themselves contribute to this type of stereotyping. Basically, having to deny and having to stand up and having to denounce is like being on Piers Morgan and asked, do you condemn, do you condemn, do you condemn? That the underlying grammar or the underlying assumption of such forums is also that, that Islam is some sort of uniquely violent movement or religion. That's to say nothing of some of the shady characters and mixed motives of the people who create such forums. Knowing that Muslims are actively attempting to combat negative violent stereotypes against themselves, many groups such as Zionists, especially liberal Zionists, has, have attempted to get onto this sort of interfaith bandwagon in an effort to sort of normalize Zionism as its own thing. So basically you have a Muslim scholar or an Islamic scholar that wants to come onto a forum to speak to non-Muslims about how Islam is not violent, and there are Zionist rabbis or other folks who will exploit that need and they will create venues and they will create forums, they will create events where they also get to push their ideology of the normalization of the Zionist occupation of Palestine. And this is a way in which many, many scholars have been duped and have been used. And so our brother Anwar is asking scholars, and I think that it's a very, very reasonable ask, to be more judicious in the invitations that they accept, to realize and to do your homework and to see the motives or the possible motives behind the people who are inviting you, that you have to take a certain amount of responsibility when you are going to show up to a stage. You lend credibility to it. You lend credibility to the entire idea that is undergirding that event and that initiative. There's a really good article on this that is uh, that was written by Sister Sana Saeed called An Interfaith Trojan Horse, Faith Washing, Apartheid, and Occupation. It was written in the Islamic Monthly. I highly recommend that you check that out and read it. It's got a lot of good information and a lot of case studies and examples for how Zionists have used what she calls faith washing, and it's a nice term, to basically clean up the image of apartheid and Zionism. Similarly, in the world, uh, so the war on terror framework, much of this work has been predicated upon a good Muslim, bad Muslim dichotomy, meaning that some spaces are basically asking you or subtly pressuring Muslim scholars or Islamic scholars in these forums to throw a certain segment of the Muslim community under the bus. It tempts the Salafi to throw the Sufis under the bus. It tempts the Sufis to throw the Salafis under the bus. It tempts people to throw their internal sectarian opponents under the bus to the non-Muslims and basically say that we're the good Muslims, they're the bad Muslims, they're, they're the ones that are violent, they're the ones that are barbaric because of this classical scholar that they study you know, from hundreds of years ago, and such distortions, that all Muslim scholars have to have the maturity and the, the insof, the, the charitability and the fairness to see through these ploys, to resist the temptation to sell out your brothers and sisters to non-Muslims who are attempting to basically put you in that position in the first place. Uh, and we've got many, many quotes here from the article. We should say beyond the quotes, to recognize the institutes and the initiatives that are engaged in this, right? So one of them, the Shalom Hartman Institute, is one of the more famous ones, right? And the article says that their interests lie not in fostering better Jewish-Christian Muslim relations for the sake of interfaith, but rather in fostering relationships with key leaders to normalize Zionism. If you remember MLI, Muslim Leadership Initiative, uh, where these Zionist groups were attempting to court 
Muslim leaders and fly them to occupied Palestine and give them basically wine and dine them in order to have a positive um, image of the occupation, that this was all very, very, very strategic. This is manipulation. And Muslim scholars, Islamic scholars have to do better. And I'll put myself first in line there, have to do better when it comes to being more judicious and selective about which invitations they are accepting and which ones they aren't. Many, many times, the, the and I can personally relate, the scholar just doesn't do their homework. They just, they get invited, they say, they look at the calendar, they say, I have a free day. Yeah, sure, let's go. The worst case scenario is people who are making this into a grift. So people who are doing this for money and for connections or things like that. But my personal experience, I don't see that as the majority situation. The majority of the situation and I have reached out to people in the last year where I saw them on a flyer or somebody pointed out to me, they saw them on a flyer and there was a similar type event happening, a faith washing event happening, where I reached out to them. I say, hey, did you know that the person that you're about to share a stage with has done X and Y and Z and they're actually trying to support Zionism and they're actually using your presence to uh, make normal and to normalize their Zionist politics? The vast majority of the time, in fact, every single time, uh, the person I reached out to had no idea. I said, wow, this is really crazy. Now, the sad thing, and I think the thing where Muslim scholars and Islam scholars need to be challenged more is what they then do with that information. So unfortunately, the majority of the time when I have brought this to somebody's attention, they have said, well, I already said I was going. Well, I already gave my word that I would be there. And so I feel like there's this, this is part of the, the ploy and the tactic is that once they get you to agree, now there's these sort of social niceties that we feel afraid to break. And we are hesitant to go back on our word and things of this nature. However, my personal opinion is that the harm of the events themselves far outweigh going back on your word. And obviously you committed to this type of event without the knowledge of what the nature of the event would do. If you had had the knowledge about what the effect of the event would be, would you have accepted the invitation? Chances are I'm going to have Husna done and say, no, you wouldn't have. So if the answer is no, I would not have accepted this invitation if I had known about the nature of the actors and the institutes that are putting it on, then that means that you should tell them that. And it's very, very important to tell them that, not to make up, let's be courageous here, not just to tell them, oh, I'm sick, oh, the my my cat ate my, my, my speech that I was preparing, or make some sort of lame excuse. No, tell them that I have now become aware that your institute or this particular speaker has these politics, and I refuse to lend credibility to such people. If you want to go to... Um, I think like what Galloway in the UK, he has a very, very famous viral video. He was invited into a talk and he was under the impression that it was he, it was just going to be him and he finds himself on sort of a panel discussion or following uh, some sort of Israeli official and he walks out. He says, this is not what I agreed to and I refuse to normalize or participate. I'm sorry, Mr. Galloway. You said we, are you an Israeli? I am, yes. I don't debate with Israelis, I've been misled, sorry. We need Muslim scholars, Islamic scholars, we have to develop that type of izzah, that type of pride in our work, and that type of awareness of what our presence lends credibility to, and that type of courage. You have to train them. You have to train them. There have even been people who have invited me within the last two or three weeks to share the stage with uh, people within the Muslim community whom I deem their, pro their politics on Palestine to have been very problematic. I deem them to have not been as principled as they should have been. And I have rather than simply say, no, I can't make it, no, I'm busy. I have said, no, I will not share the stage with this person. I do not believe in giving credibility or lending them legitimacy to the way that they're pursuing politics. And of course, with other Muslims, you don't have to go to the level of saying, you know, I believe that this person is sinful or they're, you know, they're a sellout or they have a bad intention. You don't have to go to that level. Just realize that your presence gives credibility and you need to be very, very judicious in giving that, granting that credibility or withholding it. Now, speaking about credibility and faith washing and whitewashing, the social media influencer by the by the name of Nas Daly, his actual name is Nusser Yassin, was confronted in Tokyo, Japan for his whitewashing of Israel's crimes in Palestine and in Gaza. This man's not for you guys. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Where are you from? Japanese. I think he's Japanese. That's incredible. A Japanese person is coming to tell an Israeli Palestinian what to think. Yeah, Israeli, yeah. I want to say that I came here for the event, but after listening to you and after listening to him right now, I'm not on his side. The basic of humanity is to not laugh when somebody's dying. He was confronted with protesters, people accusing him of being complicit with the genocide, saying that uh, we don't need influencers complicit in genocide, and giving him an earful. Now, uh, if you know anything about Nasseri Yassin, he certainly deserves pushback and he deserves to be held accountable that there is a lot of sketchy stuff going on when it comes to his um, his identity and how he kind of uses his Palestinian identity sort of kind of really, but plays into Israeli propaganda and is actually a very ardent supporter of Israel. In fact, he has said, uh, quote, that he is Israel first, Palestinian second. So he is somebody who is very much um, in the business of using that identity to lend credibility, because obviously if it were just Israelis who were attempting to justify their crimes, then it would have very little credibility. But every single Palestinian or person of Palestinian heritage that Israel is able to collaborate with or to utilize or to manipulate and the sometimes blackmail, if you know anybody from Palestine, they'll tell you about this then it gives them more credibility because Israel's always attempting to portray it as somehow liberating Palestine and Gaza from the violent elements, as if the occupation had nothing to do with that in the first place. <laughs>